this whole series of talk that we've been giving, uh, it's called How Does Modern Lifestyle Affect the Way We Interact? And it's all been about exploring uh, the future and to try, some, try to find some inspiration for the future and about finding new ways of think, thinking about interaction and about communication. And I think what we're going to hear today from you, Kate, um, Kate, who is a creative scientist, just that thing, creative scientist, just think of what that could um, bring to life, you know. But what we're, we're going to hear here today are going to be very interactive. And I just want to warn you that I think some of you might like hop off out of your chairs uh, a few times. But we want you to interact and we want you to take part and uh, to ask questions uh, along the talk. So feel free to be very non-Swedish here tonight and, and talk to Kate, okay? So welcome, Kate Stone. so much for having me here to speak. Um, yeah, so I will tell... Oh, I'm already making some noises, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay, I'll take that. Yeah, I kind of make a lot of noises. Um, yeah, so what I'll do is I'll tell some stories about um, about what I do and... Oh yeah, I call myself a creative scientist, I, I made that up. So <laughs> I don't know if anyone else is a creative scientist, but I... Um, I'm a scientist, um, I did a PhD in physics, before that I studied electronics, um, and then I kind of seemed to have discovered my creative side and worked with lots more creative and sort of art-based people, and so this kind of ended up being that mix of creativity and science, I think, although scientists are creative anyway. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll tell some stories about what I do, about how, about my journey, um, and show you some of the things that I've made. Um, however, um, you must ask me some questions. <laughs> I need to feel that um, people are slightly interested. <laughs> so feel free to ask a question whenever. And usually when I speak, it's kind of a meander through, through my journey and through, through things I've done and why I've done them. So there's not really a script. And I'll play some videos that show some of the things I've created. So if you ask me a question, even though I'm in the middle of saying something, it's, it's totally cool. I'm happy to meander wherever. Um, yeah, so I guess the, the, way that, the way that I work is instead of thinking about um, something that I want to create, something that I want to invent, I think the way that I've ended up following what I was doing just from the discussion earlier is that I allow things that I come into contact with, um, things that I play with, um, and things that are around me to sort of guide me into into what I create. So I try to listen to people around me, listen to machines, materials, methods, and, and how things are done, and, and let those things direct me, which in a way is kind of like letting the universe direct me a little bit. Um, which can sound, um, well, I was going to say, it can sound as if there is no plan, but actually there is no plan. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <clears throat> after I did my, my, my physics PhD, I joined a startup um, that was in Cambridge, in the UK. And that startup was looking at how to use printing processes to, to print transistors and to print chips. So really how to take printing processes and put them into the clean room to make electronic devices. And I, and I did that for four years. Um, and it was kind of based around, um, they had a plan right from the beginning um, for their business plan, exactly what they would be doing one month later, two months later, three months later, four months later. Um, 15 years later, they still haven't done what they, what they planned to do in the first month, because that's, that's, that's life, that's the way things work. Um, and, I, and I worked there for four years, and, and I, I really enjoyed it, and enjoyed the people I was working with. Um, but it just wasn't really my style, my, my way of doing things. I think um, it was thought that the company will be successful because there's 40 PhDs working there who are all very clever, and are going to invent the next thing that they think that the world needs. Um, and it was a real struggle to sort of listen to not just where the world was, but where, where the world was going, when you're kind of extrapolating from your inventions, from the things that you've created, that you're going to work hard on for many, many years, um, um, without really so much having the ability to, there was definitely the desire to listen to, the, to people around and to try to somehow be creative. But there wasn't really the, the ability, I would say, 
Um, so I left after, after four years, and um, I started out in my garage, and I decided that I needed to set myself totally free. Um, and it was very, very scary to leave my job, and it was just very scary to be in isolation in my garage. And, you know, lots of things get in your head, like, you know, you just feel very inferior, you feel, you feel, feel very judged by people, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing, how, how am I going to make this work? Um, but there were two things I told myself in the beginning. One thing is, as I've already just said, the plan was to have no plan. And having no plan totally set me free from anything that I promised anyone that I was going to do. Anything that I promised anyone to raise some money and then be forced to stick to. And, and you know, as you go along your journey, um, if you listen to things along your journey, and those things guide you in a way that you're actually supposed to follow. And it, it deviates from a plan that you've had because when you have a plan, it doesn't include any of the things you're going to discover as you go along day by day. It, it, you know, you don't know those things. So there's this deviation and then there's a constant tension between you said you would do this and you haven't. But like, well, I've done this and it's amazing. I don't care. <laughs> and it's just this tension. So I set myself free and um, the idea of not having a plan is kind of pretty cool because to have no plan you just don't have to do anything. <laughs> and I think I'm inherently lazy. And the second thing is, um, I decided I was going to create things, invent things that my science friends would laugh at, look down on, pour scorn on, ridicule and say had no purpose, had no value. Um, and I was really successful at that, which was great. <laughs> I can remember being at some sort of like government working group funding meetings where they're deciding where the funding should go and there was lots of funding towards printed electronics which is which is really the area that I work in um, and I remember one of the professors saying there's no way that that she should be funded doing the work that she's doing because it's not scientific enough and it's kind of frivolous um, and they just did not see the purpose in what I, what I was doing um, but I do remember like a year or so later seeing um, that professor when he thought I wasn't looking at touching some of my posters and starting to smile and almost moved a little bit <laughs> as if he was dancing um, because I want to create things that connect with with everybody with anybody with 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 a child with you know someone who's old I, I want to I want to I want to create things that that aren't don't have value because they impress people through it's some technological achievement or you know it looks as though I've kind of like invented something that was really really difficult um, I, I want to create things where the value is purely experiential so so you know people just become immersed in an experience and I, I want them to not even notice that I've done anything and notice that I've invented anything or created anything which is a challenge you know it, it's like being like an, an you know the, the most awesome IT person um, who if they do their job well, no one even knows you have an IT person. Um, and if they don't, then you know they're constantly going around saying how amazing they are because they're fixing all of these things. You kind of just need things to be to be magical. Um, so everything that I do, um, and it's not just me. I have a team. I keep forgetting that because I think when I say me, I mean I mean my business and my and my colleagues. Um, so there's a team of eight of us in Cambridge, and you know and. But it's taken me a long, long time. It's been over 10 years, that, that 10 years ago when I started out in my garage. Um, and I think um, I decided that I wanted to be an explorer. I wanted to be free to just go on this journey and let whatever I bumped into, whatever I tried to do that was successful or failed, become part of, become part of my mind, really. So every, everything, everything I connect with becomes part of my mind and realizing that my mind is not in here it's is is as everything and everyone that's around me and kind of like growing that um so in a way um even though i worked in isolation a lot as in not really working with other companies um in some ways you can become very connected to to like a, a greater space rather than just working with a few other people or in a community um so like I say, what I do is based around printed electronics and there's conferences around printed electronics, other companies doing similar things. And the more I was in that sort of group of people, that kind of ghetto of people, the more aligned my thoughts 
were, and my inventions and what I did were to those other people. And, and everything we did impressed each other, and in, and in some ways we, were, we thought what we were all doing was amazing compared to each other. But we're not really connecting to the rest of the world. Um, and so I've distanced myself a lot from that and don't really go to any sort of events or conferences to do that at all because I want to connect to everything and, <clears throat> and to everyday people. And I think somehow, kind of like magically, what we do right now, um, 10 years later, seems to be very, very much of the moment. Um, and I don't, so we, we don't like, I, don't, I personally don't like labels, so I don't like saying, oh, we do wearables, we do internet of things, we do printed electronics. It's just like, we, we create things that I hope you, know, you will find are somehow magically interactive and somehow of the moment. Um, and I'll show you some things in a moment. I mean, one of the things, we've made an album cover, we did an album cover for a double vinyl, um, I think it's about a year and a half ago. Just before vinyl was coming back, somehow right at that moment we created this album cover um, that was, is kind of pretty cool, so hopefully it will work. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'll show you something, otherwise I'm talking about some computers and stuff. Can I borrow it? Yeah, so this is a poster we created a while ago, and it's a drum kit poster. So, I don't know if you can hear that, it's kind of... I'll let you play with it. <laughs> yeah. So what we do is actually really, really simple. Um, let's see if I've got something. So we is we print conductive ink. Um, and we just screen print that. So we can either screen print the conductive ink just using traditional screen printing. So this can be screen printed in any city in the world. Um, and in case you want to screen print, it's just how you print t-shirts. And with screen print, we can print from, say, the size of a postcard to the size of a bus shelter, is what I normally say, but actually recently we printed um, a 50 foot long poster, um, six feet high in the street in Austin, which was pretty cool. <laughs> and we also print with flexo printing. This is how, um, and they're both stickers, so you can peel off the back of the sticker. So um, this is how like shampoo bottle labels are printed, or just stickers. And this is a bit where I like to be dramatic. <laughs> Somehow pass that around. <laughs> Um, and with that process, that's flexo printing silver and carbon ink, and we can print <laughs> we can print that at 100 meters a minute, um, and it's on a, just a traditional printing press. So, in a way, like what I was doing before I was doing this, we were looking at how to take these machines, these materials, and methods into a clean room, modify them, change them, and reinvent new machines, new materials, and new methods. Try to get them in the clean room, and try to get them to make these electronic devices. And everything was really kind of like, quite alien to what it was supposed to do. And what I do is totally the opposite way around. So I will go into where they already screen print. I'll go into where they already flexo print. And all of the limitations of those processes and, and how these things are made, they all become information and signposts to tell us how we should do what we should do. So everything we end up creating ends up being totally fit for purpose. And it's a very organic process, you know, it's kind of like how an acorn becomes an oak tree. It, it becomes an oak tree only from what it touches, only from what is around it, and through a slow, iterative process. And then when that acorn's become an oak tree, it is season by season by season has become totally fit for its, for its environment and, and really robust. And that's my excuse for taking 10 years. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think the processes and the way we do things are so simple and, and, and so fit with how manufacturers who we use already make things. Um, 
that it, it can almost seem like we've, we've not done anything at all. So we screen print those inks, Glexo print those inks, um, and then we have a small circuit board, which I might have. That sticks on the back. So this circuit board, um, this, this circuit board is a Bluetooth one. Um, and really the only bit we use is a little bit in that white square. But the reason it's so large is because the pads on the print are really large. Um, and that's how we stick the two together. So we just do that print, press that on, and then these surfaces become interactive. And I think because, because we're listening to the machines, and I keep saying the same thing, <laughs> but because we sort of listen to the machines and then we, the things that I create, if people like them or not, that then kind of merges our direction. So, and I'm, I'm, you know, just thinking, thinking about the theme, I think what we end up creating becomes so of the moment and it's influenced by our, mod mod our ways of manufacturing and our lifestyle that, that I, I think everything that we create fits um, where we are right now, but also hopefully where we're, where we're going in the future. Um, so because so much that is around us is about touch and you know it's it not that many years ago that the iPhone came out, I'm not sure how long, it was like seven years ago or something, not very long ago at all. And that concept of touch um, on the device that so many people had I think has transformed people's expectations of how we interact with the world around us and with each other in a very, very dramatic way. One of the things that we say about print is that to the iPad generation, print is a broken touch screen. And <laughs> I imagine that some of you, or all of you, have heard of stories of two-year-olds trying to pinch on a magazine page and zoom on an image, or touch a magazine page and swipe and expect, expect things to change. Nobody's taught them that. They've just picked that up from where we are right now. And, you know, they are a generation at, beginnings of a generation at two years old, where their expectation is, is that everything is potentially a touch surface. That you, know, you just touch something and magically what you want to happen, happens. Um, and that's what I believe so much the future is going to be like. When I think about what digital is, there's three things that come to mind, and one of them is touch. So, and the second one is connectivity. So, um, it, things that have a connectivity, so content is updatable, is changeable. And the third thing is data. So, things that know when they've been touched, know where they are, and so much of the value of what is digital around us that value is based on data. So you take those three things, touch, connectivity, and data. That, to me, defines a digital experience. And I'll just put this down. Um, so much that what is digital um, has killed off many of the things that are around us that we know and that we love. So physical music, um, books, high street, um, I say physical advertising, not this necessarily something that everyone loves, but <laughs> um, you know, um, all of these physical sort of things that we love um, have been declared as dead or, or dying. And it's not because they're physical, it's because they don't have touch connectivity and data, it's because they, they are competing against a digital experience which actually offers so much more in, in, in that area. So what I'm really fascinated by is, what if we could take those three things, touch, connectivity, and data, and I call those three things a digital soul. So what if we could take those digital souls and put them into everyday physical things? So now all the physical things around us become digital things. Because what we think of as digital isn't actually digital, generally. When we think of a smartphone, we think of a computer. They're physical devices that are portals to a digital experience. So they're still physical. So if, if books and you know, the album covers and things, if they can have this digital soul, which is touch connectivity and data, along with 
a kind of description as to how it should behave and what it should do and how it should respond to things, much in the same way as, as our souls, because our, our souls are something that we cultivate throughout our life that kind of determines how we react to things. Um, and so that's, that's really what, what we're trying to do. Um, maybe let me think what I should show, or I will show you a video, I think. Ask me a question if you want. Yeah, go, oh, good. Uh, if, uh, if touch screens are increasing, yeah. uh, the popularity of it, how are you dealing with it resource-wise? I've heard that they use a lot of, not rare metals, but still, there's, there's got to be some sort of limit to how much we can have when it comes to touch screens. Yeah, yeah. So you're, um, so I guess that's based around, um, so, so generally a touch screen is, is, a, is an XY multi-touch layer over a video display. Um, and that's generally done with um, indium tin oxide, which is transparent conducting metal oxide. Um, and that's used to, to pattern the, uh, this sort of XY grid um, of, of, of a transparent conducting material, basically. I, I, I know you know <laughs> what I'm just saying. Um, um, but what we're talking, and what we're talking about, or what I'm talking about, is um, it's not necessarily over a video display. So that thing that I passed around the large sheet, that's a full XY multi-touch trackpad, and that's printed with carbon and silver inks. So we print fine silver lines, which are the conductors, and and they go out to little diamond areas, so we can conduct electricity out to all these rows and columns. And then we fill in the diamonds with carbon ink because that's it conducts just enough, um, and it's much, it's much cheaper to fill out those larger areas. So we're using silver and, and carbon, um, and we're printing that 100 meters a minute. Um, and the process is really super cool. Um, it's actually what I passed around is a double laminate of two. It's a laminate of two transparent plastic sheets. So down the press goes this transparent web. Then the first station prints silver X electrodes. The next station prints the carbon, fills them in. Then the next thing, we laminate in another layer of transparent plastic. Um, and then we do the same again, we print the Y silver, and then we print the Y carbon, and then that comes out of the press, and then it's cured as it goes a long way. And we can do that in any city in the world. We just, it needs a, a certain heater that we sort of bolt onto the press. Um, so, and it's not really, what I'm trying to do is not really recreate a computer or recreate an iPhone everywhere. It's not like a vision of minority report where everything becomes a touch screen. Um, it's actually a very, very different vision to that. So I'm not talking about putting touch screens everywhere. I'm talking about just letting everyday opaque objects be a touch surface. So you can touch them and, and then they make a little symbol noise. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so it's, it's kind of different to what you might see on an iPhone screen. However, we can print to transparent um, touch screens as well. And we do that by printing very fine, a very fine mesh of silver electrodes. And we can get something like 90, 92% transparency. And we do that on the same flexo press. So yeah, so, and, and you know, that's from thinking about the things around us, letting, playing with those things, think about how they might be a touch surface, tell us what they should do, rather than trying to go, here's an iPad, let's make everything into an iPad. It's, and that's what I was trying to sort of get across before. It's, it's like a different way of thinking. And then working with the machines, and letting the machines tell us how to make those things. So not looking at how we do things in a clean room and how we make those displays. How can we take an iPhone display and the way it's made, how can we put that on all those things around us? It's like, no. Print is the most pervasive user interface. It's absolutely everywhere. So how can I work with the printers and, and let their, their processes become my challenges? How can I fit in with how they work? And that's just generally how I try to do everything. Yeah. Oh, What's your current size limitations? How big touch things? Uh, yeah, so the largest we did, largest we've done so far is, is a, um, well, it's a 50 foot long wall in the street. Um, and that was made out of, it was tiling posters. Um, and so I think the largest is about 2A0 as a panel that we do. Um, 2A0, and then we've been doing A0, A0 is stacked. 
So, about four feet. I'm stuck in feet for some reason, it's really annoying. It's easy to, to imagine. <laughs> Do you know, here's the answer. Yeah. That, what, man, about that wide, about that tall. Will it, and when will it be bigger? When will it be bigger? Um, it could be bigger. I mean, we could, we could do about 10 feet size panels with screen print. It's just we have to throw a couple of kilos of carbon in the, in, the, in the printer, but it's fine. It's just screen. There are huge screens. I mean, there's, there are screens that, you know, that are 10 feet square or so in, in lots of cities around the world, which is kind of pretty cool. But it's not that this technology will make, you know, touch things much bigger than screens are made. Um, there'd have to be a reason, so what, what would it be for? What do you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> so it's not it's not driven by trying to push the limit of to do the biggest thing in the world. It, everything is driven by an experience we want to create, and and so we don't do things any bigger than that because I don't know what those things are going to be yet. Like when I spoke to someone, I put like a massive can of oil on the floor, like out of the film bit, um, and I was about to demo it on the stage for like a thousand people. And then I realised I actually can't play piano. <laughs> this is a very awkward moment. But we just tile down lots of pianos. Yeah, yeah well, it's uh, connected to this actually. It's about creativity versus need. Because it seems like you are working out of creativity more mm -hmm. than a need. And in this world, like the startup world, a lot of uh, things are always, everybody's talking about the need. To go out and find the market need. And then you start inventing and developing. But you are working from another point of view. And it seems like you are very much ahead of your time. You said that you, you were into IoT before IoT was, uh, uh, was before we were aware of that. Mm -hmm. And you talked about vinyl, how you were doing vinyl before it was cool. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about like creativity versus need? How, where do you get your like? So it's, it's like both, and it's yeah. just it's just through talking with people and connecting with people. So I talk to people who have machines and make things, who have inks and make inks, have chips, you know, and make chips. I understand the lay of the land about how things are made. But then I go along and I talk to people who know none of that world at all, and I'm in a very creative world, so toy companies, advertising agencies, and just go along and say, well, these are some of the things I'm starting to do. And um, what would you want it to be? What would you want it to create? And then they might say, um, you know, oh, I wish it could do blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, wow. And then, <laughs> how am I going to do that? <laughs> um, and then those ideas get in one side of my head. And then how we make it gets in the other side of my head. And then I basically sit and do nothing <laughs> and meditate or sit on the toilet or in the shower. <laughs> and then suddenly it's like, wow, okay, if I use this, I can make this bit happen. And then, so it's really looking for overlap. But it's overlap from both sides. And it, but it's really important. It is, it is needs or desires or people's what ifs that are out there in the world. And it's where that overlaps with, you know, we, we can make these things. But so often when it's on the manufacturing side, what I want to do, people tell me, is impossible. Um, and that's when, that's when I have to get a little bit annoyed. <laughs> So, I mean, in a way, we'll, we'll all, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that, and that is, yeah, and that's, that's actually a really fun part of it. It's my, it's, it's the most fun thing. And for me, the measure of that is when someone plays with something, do they smile? Um, so, you know, if we can create a smile, then we kind of know that we're getting something that's, that's, that someone's enjoying. So, um, and we're all users. So it's a case of being, all of us being like a child and playing with things. Um, but as much as possible, I want to get things in people's hands and, 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 and let them play with it. It's just been a really, really long process because for so many of the years, I was just creating stuff that no one ever saw, no one, no one ever knew. There was just a few of us in the team and we were really were like in, in isolation. But I mean, one of the things, so an example of how that might have happened, so like maybe for both of the questions. Um, it was about four years ago, I was having a coffee with someone at a toy company in LA. Um, and they were talking about a new, new Disney show that was coming out. It's called Princess Sophia. Um, Princess Sophia the first, I think it was called or something. Um, and she's this new, she's the first commoner Disney princess, and she's a child, and, and she has this magical amulet. 
that the magical amulet lets her talk to animals and other objects, um, and, he, and she lets her talk to them or hear words of wisdom from them. So they said, Disney would really love that to come to life somehow. Can you think of a way to do it? So what I thought of is you could have like little cards, just regular printed cards, but, and when you slip them into the amulet, there's conductive ink on the inside of the card that no one can see. Um, but the amulet can read off the conductive ink and know what card it is, and then it can speak the Disney words of wisdom. They weren't very wise words. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, and, and how I did that was looking at how they print already, so we can put those codes on using how the cards are already printed, so it pretty much costs nothing. And then an amulet will have a button and a sound chip in, so we work with the sound chip that they would use in China, the low cost sound chip, the same you find in the greetings card. Look at how we can write code on that chip, just run some pads out from it on a circuit board that already exists, let those pads overlap that conductive ink and basically create a reader out of nothing. It, it costs nothing pretty much to make it because we use the chip they already use, the battery they already use, the circuit board they already use. And we just think about that manufacturing side and somehow let it magically merge with the experience. And so we're trying to create things in a way that costs nothing and that's kind of an example of how those two sides came together. And they made 600,000 of those toys and they were like sold all over the world and and you know, we got a few pennies. <laughs> but but it, it, it's all good. And that was like quite a wonderful journey how that happened. Um, yeah, I'll show a video. Gosh. My brief was to visually articulate the flavour um, through colour, pattern and form. The sort of biomorphic shade is really my attempt at trying to capture that taste of explosion. For me, what I really love about this project is not only are you going to be able to, to see this post that you're going to be able to hear it and touch it and it's a complete sort of multi-sensory experience. What makes this ink special compared to just a normal standard ink? When someone touches this poster, the idea is that beautiful chords of a piano actually play from your mobile device and each plume is connected to a different chord, so if you were to swish your hand it'd fall across it, it would kind of have an explosion of sound. So what we've done here is create an interactive poster that works off a Bluetooth platform. Effectively, your mobile phone becomes the speaker. Everything now seems to be on an iPad or an iPhone or looking at on the screen. In a way, we've kind of hacked paper. We're trying to figure out a way of getting that interactivity back into print so it works hand in hand with the digital world. That was fun, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was very fun. That's something we did a couple of years ago. And again, it was an ad company saying, is it possible to do such and such? And we kind of figured out how to do it. And um, so that's using Bluetooth 4. So, and the reason we really started using Bluetooth 4 and started doing things off of an iPhone was just that Apple put Bluetooth 4 onto. I think it was the iPhone 4S, and that came available, and then that's what we used. It's like it wasn't a plan. It's just that's what Apple brought out. So, so all of all of the Bluetooth stuff we've done has been based around Bluetooth 4, and um, just taking advantage of, of everything that it can do. Um, I think it was probably now nearly two years ago that Apple brought out um, Bluetooth 
MIDI. Um, so yeah, uh, um, MIDI over Bluetooth in iOS um, 8 and OS X Yosemite. So suddenly then we could start to make musical instruments, which was kind of like, which was really fun. <laughs> um, and that was great because it's using a standard that's on the iPhone that's now coming out on our Android and, and Windows 10 as well, that is kind of just a bit behind um, with, with adopting that. So I'll show something, another video, something we created recently. Oops. Think about an accomplishment. I can see you watching me. Approach everyone. Positive, but if you can't pick your fan, you're not the man. Think about an accomplishment. I can see you watching me. Creating music can really trigger creativity in young people. That's why McDonald's in the Netherlands introduced Matrax. A paper placemat turned into a full music production station. By the use of conductive ink on a piece of paper, we connected our placemat to your smartphone. Every touch point triggered a full sound bank to kickstart your creativity. Let's go, let's go. Just select the beat and you're good to go. Create your own sounds and melodies. Then you can tweak your track with any kind of effects. You can even record your own vocals. That's how you play the placemat. That's no good. And this is how we challenge your talent by showing your music skills at McDonald's. That's kind of fun. That is when that is when I just a few weeks ago. They make it look as though it was the whole of the Netherlands. In reality, I made twenty. <laughs> <laughs> and and it was it was a side project. It was something they asked us if we could do. Um, I think I designed it sat on a plane. I designed the circuit. So the circuit that I was showing. That's that, and it's a sticker. Um, and then we just stick this graphic on top, and I can show you. Um, and then stick the circuit board on the back. And it just took me a day just just to put those together. It was a small project; didn't even get anyone else in the team involved. Um, but it inspired so many people. It went really quite viral through the music industry and all, all over the places. Lots of ad agencies have seen it. So now they're like, can we roll this out globally? Which could be quite exciting. <laughs> Um, wait, what should I show you? So, we made this boom box. I'll show you what's inside. So, everything we do is the same thing. It's the conductive ink sticker. We just stick that on the front, stick a graphic over the top. Stick the circuit board on, and this is not the Bluetooth one. This is the one like the drums that plays its own sound. And we created these software tools that are really, really easy to use. So there's actually no programming for anyone to do. Like any of these experiences can be made in just like actually a few minutes, really, to, to create it. So we have a software tool where you just drag and drop some um, some sounds into a window. You have a list of all the touch points that go on the circuit board or where they go onto the sticker. You choose from a drop-down list what each touch point does. Is it a play button, a stop button, a volume button? Is it a multi-track recording? Um, and then you just tag the sound you want or the multiple sounds you want to activate when that happens. That creates a little binary file, which I call my digital soul. Put that on a little SD card, put it into the board, it grabs it off, it's stored in the flash, and then this just then becomes some new experience. So. So there's a young singer-songwriter called Fee Charlotte, and she was doing her launch. She's an unsigned Scottish artist. Um, and I was chatting with her in a coffee shop. Um, um, and, were, and we were saying, we're going to create an invite for her launch, because she, she was about to do her launch of her 
new single and sort of like launch her career on her own and hopefully get some interest from the record industry. And there was a box of chocolates on the table in the coffee shop. And I looked at that and I thought, why don't we turn the cardboard box into a boom box and send it out as an invite? So we made 50 of these and these went out to sort of record industry executives in, in the UK and, and, and wherever. Um, and as an invite to, to, her, to her launch. Um, and what's really exciting is that I got told the other day that the president of one of the largest record um, companies left, a, left um, a voice message on her phone saying the boom box that he'd been sent was one of the most amazing things that he'd, um, that he'd, he'd ever received. And, you know, and then she brought out her single and it's on vinyl, which is really awesome. Um, and tonight she's playing in Scotland and those executives are coming to her, to her gig. So, you know, it's like, it's not what's gonna make her successful, but it just helps her to get noticed a little bit, and then it's her talent takes on from there. So, you never know, she might be excited. <laughs> so you can play. Oh, do that. I don't know if anyone can hear that. I'll just drop it in. But you can remix, so I can turn the vocals off and the drums. So that's like one of the things we're creating where you can just touch the surface and sound comes out of it. Something else that we did recently was in Tesco supermarkets in the UK, about 40 of them was Unilever. Um, we made what are called shelf talkers, which are just the things on the shelf edge that have an image on and some text, but they don't actually talk. So we made them talk. <laughs> so when you touch them, they tell you a little bit about the product and, and basically annoy you. Um, and it's just starting to experience what if everyday things around us we can touch and they talk to us and tell us a little something without us having to get our smartphone out. Um, and <laughs> I, don't, I think this is a bit embarrassing, I probably shouldn't say, but um, a few days ago I got told that Unilever gave us an award, um, which is great. I got told by my colleagues we won this award from Unilever. And the award was for perseverance, <laughs> which was just like, oh, <laughs> I don't even really know what that means. It's like, okay, you've been around so long and you finally made something that we actually want to use in our stores, <laughs> that we're gonna give you an award. But I, what they were trying to say is that some ideas are just so big and so much like of the future and kind of like ahead of their time or need, need to just wait until they connect with something or take a long time to develop that it really takes just sticking it through year after year after year after year and that's what somehow like you know we've managed managed to do. Um, mm -hmm. what else can I show? <laughs> just bear with me one moment. How many tracks do you have on the player? And um, that's got, I think it's, that's just got one track, it's got, I think, I can't remember, I think there's four minutes total audio on time on that particular chip, but because we've done it as a four track, it's, it's 30 seconds of audio um, split into four, and that's just one of the things about software tool, you can do a four track, so you just click on that button, which is the play button, click on four sounds, and when you press play, it plays all four at the same time. And then you can make other buttons be mute buttons, so then it's muting one of the four or any of the four, but they all stay in time, so it gives you a sense of like remixing. So this is what we did for DJ Cuba. So this is, is his album cover. He wanted us to make his album cover into working with DJ Dex. Um, it's not very happy at the moment. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful album cover. He's probably, well, he certainly is one of the best scratch DJs in the world, if not the best scratch DJ in the world. Um, I'm not even a DJ, but I get, I get to pretend. I'm trying to do what 
experience um, so we printed this this album cover in the UK the design was done by a, a company in New York it's really beautiful um, and this is the vinyl it's so cool with what we try to do and the reason plastic is to make things waterproof outside so we can have things 100% plastic so and they can be waterproof which is kind of like cool and um, this is just a sticker that's on the inside of my hat the hat's made out of cork there's a sticker on the inside there's a circuit board on the inside and then quite a bit of oh i need my air horn <laughs> um yeah so we wouldn't really be printing on fabrics because like i think some other people do that or can do that and we need to always like keep our focus on where our technology platform is right now, which is printed on paper or plastic, stickers, small or large, um, and then uh, the sound, talking, music, Bluetooth, um, making things change. So we try, try now and stick around where our, our, our platform is. Um, but, I mean, you know, wearables is totally possible because we can put these paper or plastic stickers on the inside of clothes. I think the challenge of wearables is not in technology, the challenge is to decide what. Like, what, what do I want to do? What does it have to be? You know, because I've been asked that a few times, probably do some kind of wearable. It's like, just to do a wearable. It's like, I need, it needs to, I don't know what it is, you know. For me, I have a hat that plays air horn sound effects, which if I was to tell anyone that's the wearable I'm going to create, they would, well, they wouldn't even answer me, I don't think. <laughs> um, but when I get to go around and press my hat and make the air horn go off, um, people generally say that they want one now, <laughs> which is kind of cool. <laughs> so I need to launch these as a product. Um, right. So, oh, yeah. so this is my notebook with all my secrets in. Um, and I don't know if anyone knows why notebooks are called notebooks. Because they play notes. <laughs> it's supposed to be funny. <laughs> it's not that funny. Um, <laughs> again, the thing is, I can't play piano, so I wish I wish I could. So I put this on the notebook, and again, it's something that lots and lots of people want, which is so cool. So I need to bring this out as a product soon. And um, this is just linking with Ableton. So does anyone use Ableton, like, to make music? Yeah. So, I mean, it's really cool software. I, it took me a year to even dare to play with it because the, it's quite counterintuitive and, and it just really confused me. But actually I discovered you can learn it in 15 minutes, but it's just the user interface scared me off for a year. So I wanted to create Ableton music interfaces that anyone could use without even knowing they were doing it. So we made, um, to me. this is my MIDI controller. <laughs> I think even a bee could use it because we make these flowers and each flower is a different instrument and each petal is a different loop and the centre of the flower is a stop. Is it that? Yeah. <laughs> 
I'll just get you all there. Um, and these flowers are vocal one shots. And it's all quantized, so any of it comes in on time. Very obvious, right? <laughs> 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 last weekend I had so much fun because I'm a scientist and somehow I ended up being on stage with I don't know if anyone knows Boots Collins but he was like in James Brown's band was like one of the best bass players anywhere so I ended up on stage with him entertaining children I'm not quite sure how that happened in North Carolina which was also quite scary <laughs> um, I ended up as part of a kids show somehow <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm fast forward this. Sure. So, so I'm playing the half. They're all doing a jam. There's like three six on the bass. Uh, there's Mark Bunsquell from Devo um, <laughs> and, and various other people. Um, jamming and somehow I'm jamming on my hand which is quite weird and Boots was playing bass but then I went down to the front and took my hat and gave it to the children and let them start to play with it and they knew exactly what to do and then Boots came along and started letting the kids play with the notebook and they were playing with it so it was just, for me such a magical moment I mean seeing you know Bootsy from like doing his stuff in the 70s or whatever with these really young people playing with a notebook and like to me I hope that that is what future technology looks like it's going to look like beautiful old-fashioned things um, that children just intuitively know what to do without having some kind of like scary user interface yes I get to go on stage and pretend that I'm all cool <laughs> This is what we did at Easter at um, South and Southwest. It's the volume we were talking about. Yeah. yeah. I'm not very good at this. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> So that's the outside one, and it had all of the panels became loudspeakers and the sound was booming out across the street. This is what we created inside the convention center. Have you guys liked this song? 
Somehow I just imagine that everything is like, everything is just magical. Anything I walk over, anything I might want to touch, if I swipe my hand on the wall that it's going to play beats and sounds that people around me can hear and it links with the music that I'm hearing. That's like, that's what I imagine. Um, and, and that's what I want to try and create. And the strange thing has just been that when I've told people, they've kind of like been, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> let's make that happen. And that's what Bud Light said. And so we got to build five installations at South by Southwest. And, you know, when Kubert saw, saw me doing some stuff with a piece of card in the talk, and suddenly I'm making his album cover. And, and just it's just been so weird to sort of be in my isolation, following what the machines and what the things I play with tell me they can be if I sort of follow that flow. And I say I like, grow with my flow. And it's been really strange that once that starts to manifest and become things that I can show people and then tell them a little bit when my next phase of my vision is, that people have responded and said, hell yeah, let's, let's just do that. Let's make that happen. And then when you see people like, you know, in that film and the other films where people touch things and they smile and they become connected and it's got nothing to do with technology at all and it's everything to do with experience and it's all based around creativity and creating these experiences and, and the value is really in how can we creatively use what's already at our fingertips because pretty much everything that I do and everything that we use has been around for many years how can we use what is around us right now to create magical intuitive experiences that a, a two-year-old will, will not even question it's like it's actually going to meet their expectations. And when I think about the future, I think of a future, like I said before, it's not like Minority Report, it's not like the Jetsons. I believe the future will look more like Harry Potter and Mary Poppins. <laughs> and where everything is just magically interactive. So the future will look more like the past than the present. The future, say 20 years, 30 years, could look like a thousand years ago. Because, you know, the computers used to fill a room and now they fill our pocket. Their trajectory is disappearing, and they will be within every in, in, in everything. And I think so much of the last few years has been creating um, technology and bringing sort of technology together. But I think really the next phase is just is a, a massive phase of more convergence. So how can all of the creative side combine with the technical side to leave us with just a, a pure experience? Um, and when I think of science and I think of art. I think that science is an understanding of inside nature, how things work on the inside. Because science is just, just a description of how things inside nature work, whether it's ours, whether it's the stars. And, and art to me is a description of how nature makes us feel. So if we combine art and science, then we end up with nature, <laughs> I would believe. You know, we kind of go back to nature. So all of the things that we really like all join together and, and just let art and science flow back together we can end up with really natural um, experiences where 
where everything can have a digital soul, but it's also not in your face. It's not everything flashing at you and everything you touch suddenly does something. It's just like it's there. It's there if you want it in a magical way, just like you know Harry Potter might do it or Mary Poppins might, might touch those things. At least that's what I hope the future is. And I hope that it's a future really where we're not going to a scary place, but we're going to, we're going back, like we're going back home, we're going back how things used to be, or how we imagined things used to be when there really was magic. I think that our past, of the, the past that we imagined that was full of magic is, is actually the future and where we are going. <laughs> so maybe I'll stop there and then take some more questions.